I just need to warn you that uh, there's uh, the live stream that you're seeing is not actually live. Live. Uh, there is a 20 second delay from our real conversation. I don't know if it matters, but uh, just so you know. Um, and yeah, so we have our panelists today. Um, so Vicky Boykis, uh, Alexei Grigorev, and Emily Robinson. So uh, all of them have quite uh, an impressive background and achievements in data science, but particularly the, I think the main reason why uh, we decided to uh, hear from you specifically is because uh, I think both Maria and I agree that not only that you have impressive uh, kind of experience in data science, but it looks like you've spent quite a bit of time thinking and organizing some information related to just data science career in general and kind of what modern day data science looks like. Uh, and before we actually start our discussion, so there are two links that uh, we are sharing here. I'm going to post them on YouTube as well. Uh, so we're using uh, uh, the slides are not changing. You're still on the first slide. So if you wanted to show other slides. Oh, this is so weird. Um, so you only see the first slide, mm -hmm. right? Okay, uh, is that better now? Now it's the second slide, Okay, I think. So, uh, and how about now? Did the slide change? Now the links. Okay, yes, yeah, so. Uh, Perhaps you would like to go a little bit back to the uh, slide about our um, guests because people didn't have a chance to Check right. I mean, that's uh, the same description that uh, was shared in uh, uh, the meetup group. Uh, so, yeah, uh, every uh, every panelist that uh, we invited has uh, quite a few of resources that they shared online, whether it's blog posts, books, or Twitter. Like one, if if it's one thing that all of our panelists share is that they are fairly active uh, uh, people on Twitter. So, and like I have a pretty long list of uh, like whenever people ask me to kind of share a list of people that I follow on Twitter. So uh, it's about like 20 people. Uh, all three of you are on it. And so I shared it <laughs> with uh, many people already. Uh, okay, so uh, there's two links that uh, we want our uh, uh, attendees to check out. So the first one leads to Slido. So this is the polling Q&A platform uh that we'll be using to answer all your questions at the end of uh, the event so we'll not be taking questions live on youtube so unfortunately uh we'll not be actively monitoring youtube chat for questions uh but feel free to use it for like all the other communication um so we'll get back to slido about uh, maybe at around uh an hour and a half uh we'll see how it goes so one feature that I really, really like about Slido is that uh, attendees themselves can both ask the questions and upvote and download questions that they like or uh, don't find particularly insightful. So this allows us to kind of address the most pressing questions uh, first. And the second link leads to a Google form survey. Uh, so the survey is for Marie and I so that we can kind of adjust future events uh, to the interest of the attendees uh, and sort of the motivation for you to fill it out. Well, the first of all is uh, to help us make these events better. And the second thing is uh, you'll get a chance to win one out of uh, two uh, JetBrain licenses for any ID uh, that uh, you're using. So the license is for a year, but we do so for this purpose to send you a license, we do collect an email, but that's the only reason. So we are not going to send you any advertising or uh, anything of that sort. All right. Uh, with that said, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, we'll start our discussion. So the kind of first and overarching question, I guess, for today is uh, what, uh, in your opinion, is uh, data science today? Uh, how it was, how it's different from what it might have been a couple
couple of years ago and where do you think it's uh, going? So uh, I know who wants to go first. I can go uh, since I did write a post about this a couple yep, of years ago. Exactly. Um, yeah, so uh, for everyone who doesn't know me, I'm Vicky Boykis. I am a data science consultant. So the projects I work on, I work uh, for a consulting company, CapTech, um, and we do projects for uh, for large clients, for small clients, all sizes. And so we basically go in and we help them with uh, machine learning, data engineering, analysis, all that stuff. Um, so in my day to day, I see a broad variety of different types of companies, um, different industries. And so I've seen a couple of different patterns emerge. And I've also been following the industry. And so in my blog post, um, which I think is up on the meetup site, uh, basically I noted that the industry is becoming very, very large, uh, very, very saturated with people who are looking to get into the industry. And the key way to differentiate yourself is to learn to be a good engineer. And if you are starting from the beginning to work your way sideways into the industry, so um, start in um, QA or SRE or DevOps or business analysis or project management um, and work towards a data position that way. Um, so yeah, so two basic things. So the, um, the beginning of the industry, there's a lot of people and you're gonna need to differentiate yourself. Um, a good way to differentiate yourself is to learn good development practices alongside data practices, because that's gonna serve you well in any job that you decide to do in tech. And a lot of um, data science work is now engineering work to figure out how to get the data science that we've been working on for the last five to seven to 10 years into production. So that's, that's kind of my take on it. All right. I would add to that too. Um, so I, I'm someone who is less on the engineering side of data science. Like that's, you know, it's like you're saying it's a huge field. And so um, some folks fall very on the engineering side. So it's the other way too, is on the analytics side, is there's still a lot of low hanging fruit out there, right? Like just getting some basic numbers up, like basic dashboards. Um, and I see sometimes people being like, ah, oh, you know, like, why aren't I doing the cutting edge, like neural network stuff that I was promised in this field? And it's like, well, sort of like Vicky was saying, like a lot of it's like some engineering work, some like, you know, basic analytics, talking to people. Um, and a lot of that can come not with the data scientist title. So that's also my advice is to not worry so much about that title because a lot more roles are doing um, either data science work or work that can prepare you uh, to go into data science with titles like data analyst, product analyst, researcher, you know, anything that gets you working with data, I think is valuable experience. And um, what I can add to that is um... Uh, I remember when I was just studying in data science, um, like six years ago, seven years ago, um, it was quite different from now. So there, uh, back then, the focus was rather on, uh, so the companies was looking for, were looking for people with uh, uh, degrees, uh, like with PhD in mathematics, uh, uh, in physics and something like that. Um, but now the focus is indeed on engineering because everyone has realized that uh, this is more useful for for the business um, and this is what i see now so right now <clears throat> phd requirement is often uh like it's uh, often not even mentioned in job descriptions anymore while seven years ago it was often a must and i remember my first interview and uh, uh, i couldn't get a job because um, like i was uh, um they said okay everyone in our team has phd but you don't sorry uh, now this thing doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think it's also important to caveat that with, I agree, that's true, but there's kind of like two tiers of companies. There's, there's like different worlds in data science, like Emily said. Um, so there's kind of like the FANG world, like the Googles, Facebooks, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's the rest of the industry that people don't even talk about or often know about. So we hear a lot about um, having a PhD, doing neural networks, like Emily said, all that stuff. And then there's the rest of the industry that doesn't have these stringent standards at all, um, often does not require a PhD, where sometimes in Google you might, um, and does not have this these kind of criteria. So a lot of people want to apply to these prestigious companies first. And again, since I said that the market is saturated, I would encourage you to look at these companies that have, like Emily said, the more 
low hanging fruit, um, the dashboard processes, all of that, where it's a little bit easier to get your foot in the door and get a lot of experience and then move on to different companies if you want feel the need to later. And let me kind of uh, ask a related question, but sort of flip it around a bit. Uh, what do you think is the most common and counterproductive uh, career advice that you see posted in social media, blog posts, et cetera, et cetera, that is kind of taking for granted, no one really questions it, but you think that it might actually hurt uh, candidates' chances? I don't know if everyone takes it for granted, but I think definitely there can be a good amount of gatekeeping of like, oh, you can't, you know, you're not a real data scientist if you did a boot camp or if you go through this route or if you don't do this. Um, and I think that can be counterproductive because I often see aspiring data scientists like kind of falling in the trap of like, well, I'll apply to data scientist jobs once I know like this, 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 and this. And so then they just, if they're not in a degree program or boot camp or something like that, and they're self-learning or learning on the job, like that can just go on forever. And rather than going out there and like trying it out and getting some feedback or maybe accepting a position that's not exactly data scientist, um, it can be easy to feel like, oh, I have to be this perfect candidate and know everything when, of course, everyone's always learning while on the data science job. And, you know, someone who is an excellent data scientist working on forecasts may be a horrible data scientist if you put them at another company and ask them to do, you know, uh, machine learning and production. So, you know, you can't just because you're not, you don't know this certain area doesn't mean right. that you can't contribute value in another area. Okay. Uh, so uh, I guess this question is uh, specifically for uh, uh, Vicky, but I know uh, Emily's book also uh, discusses that. So what are the, uh, it, it feels like everyone for the most part agrees that uh, data science uh, is moving towards uh, more of a specialization field. So there are new job titles that uh, used to be, used to carry the name of data scientists. Now they have a different name. What are the most common job titles that uh, uh, you see these days that used to fall under the data science umbrella and how are they different between each other? So I think there's a couple of different ones. Um, so there's, there's data scientists, that's still a job title. Um, that seems to be, the most generalist now, um, there's uh, machine learning engineer, which is, as I talked about, uh, building these pipelines from end to end. So you're, as a machine learning engineer, you might be doing a little bit of modeling, but then it's uh, figuring out how to get the model into production, how to orchestrate it, how to do everything involving that. Um, then there's probably the um, research scientist or some variation of that where you're basically doing very deep work in algorithms specifically. You don't really touch the um, productionizing side and you don't really deal with analytics. It's all about um, looking, reading papers and doing algorithms. Um, then there's data scientist uh, light, I want to say. So an interesting trend I've noticed over the past five years or so is that um, since everything is data science now, people are um, devaluating that title. And basically, if you're a data scientist, you are now a data analyst, um, which is not the same thing. And I think this has happened at a, a couple of companies. Um, I know that some of the FANG companies do it. Um, I think Lyft had uh, two posts about retitling where they retitled their uh, data, data analyst as a data scientist. And this is a lot because of the market. So everybody knows data science, everybody sees data science. So nobody wants to be a, a data analyst anymore, which I think is a shame because it's an enormous opportunity and it lets you learn a lot about the field. Um, but that's something to watch out for too. So just because something says data scientist, it could either mean a statistical scientist, an actual data scientist, a data analyst, or a machine learning engineer as well. So it's kind of like both title inflation, the generality of the title and the non-specificity. So there's, in my experience, there's little, there's categories that each one falls into, uh, but there's a huge ver amount of variation in each category. Okay. And, uh, now kind of related to that, uh, Emily, I know in your book, uh, you have a specific section dedicated to what uh, candidates should look out for when they choose their company. And you have this like prototypes of uh, different companies that uh, people can kind of pay attention to different properties, characteristics of those companies and what things they should be expecting from that. 
can you elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's also a blog post specifically on the red flags in uh, data science interviews, which I uh, wrote co-wrote with my the uh, my book co-author Jacqueline Nolis. So that's on my website if anyone wants to check that out. But yeah, and basically. Part of it too, I think a big important thing to remember is there's like not one ideal data science job for everyone. There's definitely individual preferences. And so for example, um, I know people who really love being the first data scientist at the company and like doing a lot of the data engineering work too. They're like, I get to come in, I get to set it up and like do it right and like do it how I want to do it. And I know other people are like, absolutely not. I want to work on a team. Like I want a more specialized role. I don't want to wear lots of hats. So I think that's important to remember. Um, but yeah, a couple of things we talk about is, you know, as Vicky was saying, the big difference between like one of the FANG companies and, you know, a government contractor or a small startup and just thinking on the different axes that they will vary on, which include mentorship, like will there be other data scientists there, data engineering, will you have support for that engineering type work if that's something you're less interested in. Um, bureaucracy. So for example, um, like a defense contractor, there's gonna be a lot more bureaucracy. I've talked to people working for the military who can't use R or Python because they're not allowed to install it on their machine. Um, so, you know, that's something you, you have to think about, but you know, again, but some people may like that because what do those offer? Uh, sometimes they can offer like it's less stressful, right? Working at a small startup can be very stressful. You can sometimes work lots of hours, like working for a more slow moving business, maybe what you want. If you're like, you know, I'd rather have like a steady job and like kind of collect my paycheck and like I'm just taking a bit of a, you know, and, and still learn stuff there, but maybe not um, trying to find something where you're like, all right, I'm like trying to like do everything and like run around and everything's always on fire. Um, so I definitely encourage people to think about um, both from maybe their previous jobs, what they've liked, because of course, some of these, you know, bureaucracy, there's, it's not just in data science, right? Um, that's like at, at all different roles you'll deal with. So figure out like how much, you know, like for me, I kind of like when HR is set up, like it's nice to have a human resources department. Like it's nice to know like what your 401k plan is and have a laptop when you show up the first day. Um, but some other people are like, no, I don't, I don't want to have to go through processes for everything. I like it being the wild west. Um, so yeah, I think that's a couple of things you can think about when uh, thinking about like what kind of data science role you're interested in thinking both about the company in general and then specifically the data science team or lack of team at the company. Okay. Uh, so I know that mm, kind of from talking to different people who are, uh, were planning to join us uh, today and listen, uh, I would say generally there are two groups of uh, people who, there are a lot of uh, people who recently graduated and thinking about uh, data science as their uh, kind of, uh, career direction, or there's quite a few software engineers who are also thinking of uh, either making kind of a temporary change, uh, acquiring data skills. Uh, so um, it, with regards to kind of this, uh, my question is, uh, I guess, to Alexi first. What do you uh, think about this uh, transition from software engineering to data science? Because I know that is uh, your background, right? You used to be a, a Java software engineer. And uh, like, there's, it's kind of, there's several questions here. Whether it's worth it? <laughs> And what are the potential difficulties and uh, associated with it when making the transition? And uh, how does the work of a software engineer different from uh, the work of a data scientist? So, um, yeah, of course it's worth it, but it depends on uh, people, of course, of what, uh, what they want to do. So for me, it was worth it because I really wanted to do it. I went through master's and then I was thinking of doing PhD just to be able to do this. Uh, luckily, I didn't have to uh, because industry changed and uh, PhD requirement wasn't really needed. Um, uh, and I think uh, software engineers are quite good material for actually becoming data scientists because uh, most of the work we do um, is engineering work. We need to get data, and this is writing SQL queries. We need to clean the data, and this is writing SQL queries and then some, some Python code. Then we need to um, to train the model or do feature engineering before that. It's all coding. And then once the model is there, we also need to, to evaluate it and then deploy. All of this is engineering. All of this is using some libraries, some tools. And um, this is pretty different from what we um, study in online courses, for example, or uh, at university. Because at university, we study theory. But here, it's all uh, about using existing tools for 
achieving certain specific goal of solving specific problem. This is uh, for engineers. It's uh, it's what they do typically. So it's just uh, for engineer to become a good data scientist. I think what is needed is just to um, to learn the tools, uh, to learn the uh, uh, the framework, like how to set up um, a good validation strategy, things like this, and then know a bit of uh, like a, a few use cases like what you can actually solve with machine learning and then um, once they have that um, i think they are ready to to start working and even before that i know in many companies um, there are some programs uh, for uh, software engineers who want to transition to data science and uh, for example at my company we have some sort of mentorship pro pro programs when we uh, guide people through this transition. So I think software engineers are perfect material for data scientists. Okay. And I think there was a third question. I answered only two. Uh, no? uh, if uh, we remember it, we'll uh, come back to it. The third okay. so, question was um, uh, about um, probably some difficulties when trans transitioning uh, from being a software engineer to being uh, a data scientist. Are there any obstacles on your way? Mm. So the the major obstacle was uh, obstacle for me was to actually uh, it's just too much information like what to actually learn what to where to go uh, it's too difficult uh, to decide what is important what is not important there are so many online courses there are so many articles there are so many books uh, uh, there are so many competitions and uh, if you go on Twitter or LinkedIn there are so many people posting things so it's very difficult to just uh, to decide where to go and i think for this uh, for this to solve this problem well, what is important is have a problem in mind like uh, have some some problem uh, that you're solving and then focusing on this problem uh, i didn't have this so i just knew i wanted to do data science so i was just studying everything trying to uh, to go deep learn theory uh, that was a mistake, I think, and uh, uh, probably I should have gotten on Kaggle and then try to solve. Uh, I should have tried uh, solving Kaggle competitions instead of uh, spending years uh, learning theory. I think that was the main obstacle, just not focusing on the on the problems. That's actually a perfect segue to the next section about uh, kind of related to job searching, resumes, and to some degree. Uh, like different types of certifications, Kaggle achievements, etc. So, uh, let's start with the first question. Uh, sort of, what do you think uh, out of all the different possibilities uh, that uh, uh, are out there, uh, taking online courses, getting certification? Well, let, let's start with a more traditional route, like taking getting a graduate degree, whether master's or PhD, in like one of the STEM fields, uh, then just picking up a book and uh, on data science and machine learning, going through the book and exercises, get like paying for an online course, uh, like going through a boot camp, and competing on Kaggle. Like if you were to just focus on one, what uh, uh, kind of in your opinion would have the highest, like let's say return on investment, uh, whatever we define that to be in the next uh, two, three years, uh, for people who are just starting out? My strongest opinion is don't get a PhD because you want to be a data scientist. Like, oh my gosh, like PhDs are, you know, there's so many years, they're very intense. Most of them are oriented to getting, getting you an academic job. Um, like you're this very narrow field. So like, I really like, you know, some people like their PhDs, a lot of people it's, it's a hard time, but I would not get it because you want to go into industry. Uh, so that's my favorite. <laughs> that's that's my my biggest chip, I would say. Um, and then I think actually, I don't think maybe you mentioned this, but I think learning on the job is actually one of the best ways. I think if you can do that, if you are maybe in marketing and you're doing stuff like you know some stuff with numbers, maybe in Excel, like Google Analytics, can you start trying to add um, some R or Python in there, or you know even some other business intelligence tool like Looker or Tableau if your company uses that, right? Um, and maybe supplementing that with 
uh, some of some online courses, some other things. But I do think, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a personal decision and trade-offs, right? Like boot camps, masters cost money. Um, how's your family situation? Could you like, if you're pretty young, could you like go home and live with your parents? You know, is there any financing available? Um, so I do think it's hard to say that I, I don't think there's one best path for people, both because of, you know, financial considerations. And then also someone who has a, wasn't planning to be a data scientist, but has a PhD in statistics, right. Is going to take probably to take a totally different path than someone who's just graduated, um, undergraduate with, uh, degree in English, like both, I think can absolutely end up working in data science, but they're going to need to take different places to get there. Yeah, I think I would add to that. Um, I also um, I'm thinking along the same wavelengths. Uh, my biases are pretty clear because I don't have a master's in analytics or data science. I actually have an MBA, which is another story. Um, but most of the things that I learned about data science, I learned on the job and from people who were essentially better developers than me. Um, and the statistics I learned from books that I read. Um, I took a couple of online classes when I got started, but most of my experience has been basically reading books and um, learning on the job, which I think is probably the most powerful learning you can do. Ultimately, when someone is looking to hire you, um, they're looking to solve a problem. And so the way I approach um, going into interviews or from either side is, um, and I think this is really helpful for people who are looking for jobs as well, is to come in like a consultant. So you're, you're basically trying to solve this person's problem. This person has a spot that they're trying to fill and they're trying to find someone who's going to be the most capable person to hit the ground running for whatever it is that they want to do. And so the way you want to do that is you want to prove that you can hit the ground running and that you understand the questions to ask and that you understand the necessary context. And that doesn't always come through on a resume. So I think the best way to do that if you if you don't have experience is to, um, to basically do a project and talk about about the project, talk about the issues you had with the project, kind of talk through your thinking on that because they're looking for someone that they can work with. Um, so I also don't know that one path is better than the other. Um, my personal bias is to always spend less money on education when I can, but with the caveat that um, I myself am not a very self-motivated learner. So it's actually helpful for me to take some classes. Um, but I, I think that ultimately what someone is looking for is the ability it's it's very hard to tease out in an interview but the ability to have someone come in and just take care of this problem which is fill this spot that they're looking to fill right and, uh, i would say kaggle because um, when i was trying to get into data science i did masters i took so many online courses eventually i got a job and then during this job i discovered kaggle because my colleague showed me and then I tried to compete in one of the competitions. And I realized what that everything I studied at university, everything I studied in online courses was completely use, useless. I couldn't use all, anything of this to uh, to compete. Uh, so it was like Kaggle uh, teaches real life machine learning, like real, uh, like um, uh, what we actually need, like all these dirty tricks, like, uh, and also all of this, um, like how to set up validation scheme. Uh, how to tune parameters. Uh, we don't study that at university. We don't study that in online courses. Uh, we we study algorithms there. So uh, if anything, um, I think Kaggle is the best time investment. Um, I have to warn that it's quite addictive. So uh, uh, probably don't uh, overdo it. Um, but for me, um, doing competitions for half a year was uh, i learned a lot more than during two years before that so i would recommend uh, um, investing time in kaggle uh, trying to compete there and then also um, after competitions share the knowledge uh, write blog posts about this uh, get noticed uh, because the, the the community there on kaggle is uh, so big that people are looking to learn from you um, so I, uh, I would advise to to go on Kaggle, do competitions, and then after each competition, sh share how you got there. Of course, for a few first competitions, it will be very difficult. For me, it was I didn't do anything there, um, but over time it accumulated, and then after half a year, I could uh, get into top ten um, position in the competition. So 
this is uh, what I would suggest. One of the things that I've seen uh, kind of commonly, uh, like if people were to criticize Kaggle, the most common complaint that I see is that uh, while it does teach you uh, how to train uh, very powerful predictive models, the, par uh, the part where it's lacking, how do you get it to production, right? Because you don't re like you need to generate a CSV file on Kaggle and not really deploy uh, production uh, uh, solution, solution to, into production. So where do you acquire, where do you go for those skills? How do you acquire that to complement your uh, the skills that you learn uh, on Kaggle? Job. Uh, well, that's where we run into the chicken <laughs> and egg situation, right? I want to get a job, but uh, I don't have experience. <laughs> well, for software engineers, it shouldn't be a problem because they are already capable of uh, putting things into production. Uh, okay. So this is... Uh, what if we are talking option. about the uh, like either new graduates or people who are making uh, mm -hmm. like a career transition from maybe even not a tech world entirely? Mm -hmm. But I think for me, uh, like from what I see, if a person can show interest in one area, be it modeling or understanding of business or uh, productionizing models, it's enough to get hired in, uh, on the entry level position. So you don't have to be perfect in all three. Uh, being reasonably good in one of the um, in one of the areas is enough to get hired. It's it's funny because when you were first saying like the com the most common criticism is actually I was thinking of a different one which is that um, Kaggle so like the competitions come with like here's this data set and here's a problem you're trying to solve and um, oh, yeah. that is often very different from what, so I think it's like a great tool for exactly what you were saying, like working on some ML stuff because you can compare yourself to other people, you can see their notebooks, so on and so forth. But I think a good complement to that is doing um, like a, a project that you come up with yourself where you have to find the data where you, you know, whether by scraping or like using an API where you have to deal with the fact that like, you know, how do you figure out maybe there's not a signal if you're trying to do a predictive um, you know, uh, a problem or, you know, the, the problem with when you're working in the real world, is like, should I go out and gather more data, right? Like, when is this enough versus like, how do you like, well, this is all the data there is. Um, so I think a good compliment to it is, you know, going from the first steps of a project where a data science project where you're like, all right, what are we even trying to do here? What's the question I'm trying to answer the algorithm I'm trying to create? How do I find that data? I often need to clean it. And then like working on the, the models and presenting it to people. Um, and I think that can be, you know, very helpful for hiring managers to see, because also I think with Kaggle competition, sometimes what I've seen is people do that. And it's just like this, like 400 line notebook with like all this, like, you know, different stuff. And I think actually maybe with like no read me, no explanation, I think that's really not as helpful as someone who puts out like a thoughtful, like, here's what I did. Here's why I care about it. And maybe putting that in a blog post. Uh, so now uh, related questions, so since like we all kind of know roughly and, and the uh, hiring process of course differs from company to company, but a very common situation that I've seen is that uh, like there's a data science opening uh, and then like in a matter of well, like a week or two, you get uh, you know, close to a hundred applicants. And this is exactly the situation that uh, Vicky described in her post. Uh, by the way, uh, if uh, people haven't read it yet, uh, so the exact title of the post, I believe, is uh, Data Science is Different Now. So uh, that's the blog post that I think uh, we've been referring to. Uh, so obviously, uh, most people on the hiring side are not going to have time to go through every resume carefully to get a full picture of the candidate. So there needs to be some kind of way to signal uh, your skill. We'll discuss one way that if you do have some significant achievements on Kaggle, you can just put it up on your resume. So that signals something. What are the other uh, things that you would include in your uh, resume to kind of show off that to differentiate yourself from the other 99 people who applied from this, uh, for the same job? So I will say that um, the best way to get noticed in a job is to know the person hiring or know a person who knows a person who is hiring. Um, so warm connections, as I call them, are absolutely, absolutely important. And 
even if you have a super strong resume, sometimes you won't stand out unless your friend knows the hiring manager and they pass the resume along. And I've seen this happen countless, countless number of times where someone is super talented, they come from a top university, they have a top GPA, but they can't get a job just because of the sheer volume of people and they just cannot stand out. So my number one tip is to ABN, always be not working. And I know that in a COVID world right now, that's hard, but a good way to network is, um, as Alexi said, to blog something that's interesting to you, to work on a problem, put it on a blog, put it out there. Um, the more that people start to know you around the data science community, the easier it will be for you to know what these opportunities are and speak to them. So that's, that's number one. That's kind of the way to quote unquote game the system um, is you, you will, won't get a job right off the bat, but you will get to the top or close to the top of the pile if you know the person hiring. And even if you don't know them directly and you see that they're um, hiring on LinkedIn or on Twitter, there's a post, shoot them a DM and have a conversation with them if they're open to it. Um, so that's my number one tip. Um, the second way to stand out is to have projects, if you don't have any projects yet, to have projects that you can talk about that you've done, even if um, you weren't able to complete them. It's much more interesting to talk about, oh, this is why this failed. I wasn't able to get this data. I really needed this data, or my model didn't generate this result. This is why it didn't generate a result. Um, so often what um, sometimes what I'll see on resumes, I do a lot of resume reviews, is a link to GitHub. And then there's no repositories on there, or there's like two repositories that have been cloned five to six months ago. And so that also gives me zero signal. So to me, it's it's more interesting if I see a blog and there's like a real live interesting blog post. So we're in the point where there's a lot of data science content. Um, there's not a lot of data science content that is very good. So if you have good data science content, it tends to stand out. Um, so that's probably the second best way to get noticed and to do projects that are um, complete and annotated and that kind of show the way that you think about something. Right. And uh, I want to elaborate on a few things that uh, you've mentioned. So uh, today we don't have a lot of time to talk about kind of writing, but I know this is something that you personally care about. Uh, you write blog posts, you have a newsletter, and I'm just assuming that it's not like you just uh, one day woke up and got good at it. So uh, what are some general pieces of advice that you would give uh, to people on how to get better at technical, right? Let's uh, focus on that. Yeah, so <laughs> I've been writing online for 10 years and for probably the first four or five, my writing absolutely sucked. And I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm like Shakespeare or anything, but I feel myself that I've gotten progressively better the more I've written. So I think the thing is just to be consistent and to have a small group of people who read your writing and say, honestly, oh, this is good or this can use some improvement and to consistently write. So I've been consistently writing once or twice a week for the past 10 years. And I've now gotten a feel, I think, for how to write online. So I would say um, start a blog it's never been easier to start a blog. You can do it on Git pages. You can do it on WordPress. You can do it on Ghost. You can do it on a million other platforms. Um, just get going, start, because basically a resume is the kind of like the highlight reel, but the blog shows day to day how you think about things. And I've never, I always put my blog on my um, resume and I've never had a hiring manager that wasn't interested in discussing some part of it. Even some random weird, post that I wrote, like I used to put my personal blog on there and I would have a post about, I don't know, Nutella or something. And they would be like, okay, tell me about why you like Nutella. So you, sh you shouldn't probably get too weird with something that you're sending to corporate blogs. But if you have interesting real content that you're generating on data science or machine learning or the industry, people are going to be interested for sure. And uh, uh, the other thing that was uh, mentioned, and I know uh, uh, there was also, uh, there's a separate section uh, in the uh, book that uh, Emily and Jacqueline wrote uh, on GitHub repos and any kind of portfolio project. So uh, Emily, can you elaborate and kind of summarize what uh, that section uh, says and what are the good practices when building your resume and including into uh, building your portfolio and including it in your resume? Yeah, so I, you know, Vicky covered it a little bit when she was talking about how someone will link to their GitHub and they'll have like nothing or two repos. So definitely, you know, you want to, if you're going to link to it, you should have something there. And I think what makes a good project um, repo is having a clear readme that says like, what is this? Like, why, why do I care? Why did I do this? Um, 
have it be organized in some way. And it doesn't have to be super sophisticated. Like I looked at my final project for my bootcamp. All I did was just break um, the script out into like six different scripts. So I was like, here's where I cleaned the data. Here's where I did this. Like it wasn't some fancy thing where I like, oh, I have Drake or there's a Docker, all these things, like just something. So it's not a thousand line script. And that it's also a script that doesn't include all your, you know, false, uh, you know, like the, the false tracks you went down or all your like random notes to yourself, but is something that like you can present to another person. Um, and I think the final thing is what Vicky was saying was with like blog, either like a blog post or, you know, um, a, a dashboard that they can look at or like an API, like some sort of product, I think at the end is really what makes it um, most interesting. Uh, rather than just pointing someone to like reading a thousand line script, which they may or may not end up doing, they're much more likely to try out your dashboard or read your blog post or, you know, interact with the, um, yeah, oh, I saw yesterday someone, a student created this um, like Markov chain generator for tweets. So you could enter someone's Twitter handle, it would scrape the tweets, you could enter like a prompt word and then it would create a tweet, right? And that's like so much more, you know, fun and I think interesting to people than if that student had just posted like the script for doing this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that, that would be my uh, main advice on like making a good GitHub project portfolio. Right, and related to this question, what uh, things that people should not do that uh, you commonly see in their other blog posts or portfolios? Uh, I mean, like if we take a more or less extreme example, let's say someone wrote a blog post analyzing Titanic data or Iris data, they posted about it and that, also sends a signal, but probably not the one that uh, they want. So what are some other examples that uh, uh, you think that people should look out for when they're just starting out? Yeah, I think uh, doing something original, something that shows your interest, and it doesn't have to be like, I get asked sometimes, you know, like, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm interested in going to finance, like, do I have to blog about finance? And like, yeah, like maybe it's helpful. And like, presumably you're going into finance because you care about finance, but like I'm in e-commerce um, and retail, I never blogged about e-commerce. Um, you know, my last blog post was on uh, building my Pokemon team uh, and using matrices and R's to figure out what types I should have my Pokemon team. And that's not a, a serious topic. So, but it is interesting. Like it had value to me. It was useful. It was a real question, a real problem I was trying to solve. And I think that makes a much better project than like being the hundredth or thousandth or ten thousandth person, like trying to predict who's going to die on the Titanic. Um, so I think don't be afraid, you know, to let your personality show some and to do something that's interesting to you. And I think as Alexi was talking about earlier, that's also a great way to learn, right? It's because, you know, you're like, oh, I really want to solve this problem. Like, and it's, I have to get data from this website. So let me see if I can figure out web scraping and R interacting with a API. It's a good way to direct your learning uh, when it can feel like, oh my God, there's so many things I can learn is to narrow it down to like, here's a problem I want to solve. And so let me take it kind of piece by piece working towards solving that problem. Okay. And a uh, question to everyone uh, is, uh, if I can ask you to describe uh, kind of the interview process that people who go through the data science interview process for the first time, what should be, should they expect? And I hoping that uh, there will be some differences in your answers because you have worked at companies with uh, different sizes. So the interview processes are uh, different there. So what, how many stages, what each stage would uh, consist of, kind of to set the expectations for people who are applying? Um, so in our company, it really depends on the position. So for example, for a student, um, it can be just one interview, for example, with me. And then I would ask this, this student to write some sort of proposal uh, as a home assignment, and that would be it. So if the proposal is good, then okay, we can go to HR for the, um, um, for the agreement. Um, but then of course, for, is it uh, goes to junior or middle or even senior, it uh, becomes more difficult. Um, so for positions like, um, for full-time positions, like starting from junior, there is uh, 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 a process consisting of multiple steps, starting with uh, uh, first a uh, call from recruiter, then uh, tech screening, then interview with hiring manager, then there is a home assignment, then there is also in our, at our company, we have uh, assignment defense. So when actually the candidate presents the, the assignment, and then there are some questions. Um, and then sometimes there's also behavioral interviews with uh, 
a product manager, for example. Um, and I think that we, uh, what I see is um, a similar structure of the interview applies to all positions, regardless of seniority, junior, middle, senior, lead, all have the same structure. Uh, perhaps difficulty is uh, different. So for a lead position, there will be more focus on uh, behavioral part uh, and on technical. And then probably for a junior, uh, the focus will be on theory or projects from university. So I personally have had, I, I'm going to say that I don't know what a data science interview looks like because I've had a lot of different data science interviews and they've all been completely and extremely different. Um, there's a good blog post about this by Tim Hopper. I'll put it in the uh, uh, YouTube chat, but basically he says, there's little consistency. I've been asked about Java design patterns, how to solve combinatrix problems to describe my favorite machine learning model. And he goes on and on and on. And that's been my experience as well. Um, I've had interviews that have been take homes where I've been asked to write a Python library. I've had interviews that have been algorithm design. I've had interviews that have been uh, where I've been asked to scale out a system. I've had interviews that have uh, been basic statistics. I've had interviews that have been SQL. Um, so there, this is kind of disheartening, but uh, there is no exact way to prepare for a data science interview. All you can do is go by the job description and talk to the hiring manager or recruiter and say basically how, what is the best way for me to prepare for this interview? And that's not a cheating question. Um, and actually uh, companies like Google and Facebook give you entire guides on how to prepare for the interview process. Um, smaller companies obviously won't do that, but you can always ask what kinds of things can I expect at a very high level um, so that you can know going in. And, but this is also a good why it's a good idea to read widely and do one single good project. Um, so you get exposure to all of those areas. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, Emily, uh, well, do you have anything to add there? Uh, I think Vicky really covered it. And I was going to say, I think the most important point is you can definitely ask the hiring manager. You can be like, what can I expect? And they're not going to be like, well, this is the exact problem, but they hopefully will tell you something like, oh yeah, well, like this person will talk about SQL and then we'll ask you to do some whiteboard coding, you know, and there's going to be a take home at some point, right? Because I think exactly as Vicky says, there's going to be such a range. And because of that, like, don't, like, like, don't, don't feel bad and don't feel like it reflects on yourself. Like I've seen a lot of experienced data scientists like getting, and some of it's because companies don't know how to hire, right? I saw someone in the YouTube chat mentioned like, why am I being asked like leak code questions? And it's because, well, maybe they know how to hire. Well, it's just certainly disagreement of whether that's a good way to hire software engineers, but at least it's a common way. Um, and uh, so they'll just adapt that or they'll be like, I don't know, here's some like really hard like statistics problem, but someone with a lot of experience can be like, yeah, I could solve that five years ago in grad school, but like I, I, that's not the type of problems I face now. And if I really needed to like, you know, do this derivative of the kurtosis function, like I could look that up. Um, so I think don't be too hard on yourself if you do find that like you're in an interview and you're like, wow, I totally bombed that. There's it could be it could be them, or it could also be just maybe the position is not a great fit, right? As we've been talking about, there's so many different data science roles, and just because you're not a great fit for one of them doesn't mean like you can't be in the field that you can't contribute a lot to a company in a different type of role, um, and it's still data science, but a different type of data science role. Right, and uh, related to uh, some home assignments, and I know that if, at least on Twitter there's been some discussions and a little bit of pushback towards uh, against uh, very long and big uh, take home assignments. So what if a uh, person in the situation where they really, really like the company, the position, they really want uh, the job, but they get this home assignment that tells them like, well, uh, you can work on it like for two weeks. And really, if you look at it, it's like, I don't know, 20, 30 hours uh, of uh, work. So I know there's probably not a yes or no question there. So how do you approach that situation? Um. So I, in my company, we do ask uh, home assignments. I am not in favor of doing this, but this is not, I cannot change that. So what I can see, what works in situations like this, because I'm also not a fan of home assignments. And um, I often had this situation when I, I would spend hours, weeks doing a home assignment only to find out that uh, the position is already closed uh, because somebody was uh, 
already in advanced stages of the process and they just got the offer earlier and accepted it. And uh, it happens quite often. Um, so of course, uh, like uh, doing the, this five times in a row only to find out that uh, the position is already closed is uh, quite frustrating. Uh, so that's why I tend to disagree uh, to not accept home assignments. And one thing that uh, sort of works uh, for me personally is um, saying, sorry, I will not uh, do the home assignment because it will take so much time. I cannot invest so much time in doing this, but if I had time, this is how I would approach it and then describe in words, like how I would approach it. And then of course add that, um, I know that for you, it is important to assess the quality of the code the candidates write and the, the way candidates think. This is why you can go to my GitHub, check my code. This, these are the blog posts that you can also check to see how I think. And then at the end, um, uh, that uh, it would be pity to stop the process here uh, just because of this home assignment and lack of time from my side. Uh, I would really love to continue. Um, is there something we can do? Sometimes it works. Uh, most of the companies have pretty rigid process. They say, sorry, uh, this happens and more often than, uh, than not. But sometimes companies uh, try to, to change the way they do if they really want to, to advance, uh, to, to continue the process. And sometimes they can replace it with uh, the um, uh, live screening, like with live coding, uh, or sometimes they can just say, okay, let's come, let's go to our office and uh, just talk uh, like about how you would solve it. Maybe do a presentation instead of solving this. Sometimes it helps. Um, uh, so uh, I guess what you're saying is that mm, if you're in this situation, you have to find a kind of diplomatic way to say that you mm -hmm. are like, because I'm guessing the fear there is not appearing arrogant. Is that mm -hmm. um, too yes. good to be uh, doing any uh, work without being paid? Yes. Uh, Don't do that. <laughs> yes. so I think if you ask for payment, that's a... Uh, uh, this is just uh, a way to to say no i don't want to continue and uh, often companies would not even not respond to that uh, so don't do that and uh for kind of my part because uh like uh with me with the way maria and i uh, and i discussed that i would cover less kind of the technical stuff more career related and the second half will be a bit more uh technical so the kind of final question that i have for everyone is how do you approach learning and skill improvement? Because you know, like, it seems like there's infinite number of uh, different things like papers coming out every day, like number of uh, different technologies for like cloud technologies, programming languages, machine learning libraries. Like how do you organize that? How do you prioritize what you learn versus what you kind of put off for now? Um, I can take this one also start at least discussing. Um, so what I find uh, useful for me is try to not to um, to jump into new frameworks, new things, uh, because there is an infinite amount of them. There is no way we can find time to, um, to learn all of them. Um, so we should rather spend time on learning fundamentals. Uh, so for example, um, right now with these cloud providers things like uh, uh, so what i'm learning right now is things like infrastructure related things like kubernetes um, these are specific technologies but there are some underlying principles uh, of designing like a distributed system that if you learn this this will be useful for many years uh, while kubernetes might go away right so investing into these uh, fundamental things is, uh, uh, I think uh, it has better return on invested time than trying to cover all these new fancy technologies. Um, yeah. And the same with machine learning. Okay. Yeah, my strategy is I kind of, I, I think it's important to learn some new technologies um, 
just because in the consulting business, it's important to know because your clients have a range of technologies. But my strategy is also to wait until the dust has settled a little bit. For example, um, when TensorFlow first came out, everybody was using TensorFlow. Um, everybody wanted to do deep learning, all of that stuff. And then PyTorch came out. Everybody switched to PyTorch. Everybody's doing that. Um, so I waited a couple of years. I think I waited like four or five years until, and now it looks like PyTorch is becoming the dominant market leader. So now I'm looking into learning PyTorch. Um, Again, they both follow the same principles. And uh, like Alexi said, if you really want to know what's up, you should probably just start by learning about NumPy and how uh, NumPy arrays work because they're kind of like the basic starting point of both of those things. Um, and the fundamentals of both software engineering and just good data analysis practice will serve you well. But if you're overwhelmed, um, just wait for the dust to settle. Like I know me, a lot of people, me included, read Hacker News and say, oh, this is hot, this is awesome, this is interesting. Uh, just wait for a couple of years, wait till stuff stabilizes and then you can learn about the framework um, without getting too overwhelmed. And another good advantage is you're not gonna be learning at the bleeding edge, which means um, like dealing with code that is not yet fixed because it's an open source project or because it's brand new and people haven't figured things out yet. So just give it some time. And I think keep in mind like a balance of, you know, learning stuff that's going to be pretty immediately useful that you're like, this is a clear gap and like the work I'm doing for my company or for like a personal project. And then like, you know, dipping your toes into, all right, this is, I'm learning this new area that's maybe going to take a longer time to pay off. But like, it's also important for me to, to keep up those skills. Um, Cause I do, you know, sort of Vicky was saying, um, you know, I, I think especially for someone beginning to feel it's easy to like leap right to the newest thing and not, and whereas like so much more of your work is going to be the more foundational, like day to day, like, you know, cleaning data, like learning some maybe about like airflow or data pipelines, um, learning about Git and GitHub, um, good practices there. And not so much feel like, wow, I really got to be on the cutting edge of the field and always like, you know, reading the Arvix papers um, when actually a lot of companies are not really going to have use for that necessarily. Um, so just, you know, where's the more bread and butter, like day to day, um, you know, getting really comfortable in that. Yeah. Uh, like for me personally, I know that the fear of missing out is really strong. Uh, like I, I'm using a, a, a pocket. This is an application in Firefox where you can bookmark articles that seem interesting. And I'm definitely adding them uh, to kind of my shelf at a much higher rate that I'm going through that. So that's a, uh, like no, no matter how many times, like I tell myself, like I'm not gonna be able to read it, I still keep adding stuff to it. And then just uh, every couple of my months, I just purge the entire thing and start over. I know if it's a common problem or not, but that's what it looks like for me. Uh, yeah. yeah, my method is basically, this is probably like a really lazy method, um, but if enough people on my Twitter feed talk about it, then I'll, I'll read it. Um, yeah, that's a good rule that's of thumb, I guess. It. Right. Uh, yeah, that's uh, kind of all with my questions. I'll pass it on uh, the discussion to Maria. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the very beginning of con the conversation where we were talking about interviews and what can help you um, stand out. And Vicky mentioned uh, spending time uh, getting better at um, traditional classic software development practices. And um, I would like to ask uh, you, how do you think the practices, the best practices, or maybe the common practices in data science are different from the common practices in software engineering and where um, data scientists probably should spend more time building up uh, and learning uh, classical software development practices? So being uh, coming from this background, I think uh, a lot of things apply from uh, from software engineering to data science, because as I mentioned earlier, a lot of work we do as data scientists is engineering work. Um, and for me, what I think is important for many data scientists, because I see that many data scientists struggle with these things, uh, some like the way we work in data science is typically we just uh, start Jupyter notebook, write something there, and this is our model. Um, so for a software engineer, this is uh, against everything they uh, they are used to. Um, so I think well, what is uh, 
good for a data scientist to to do to learn is uh, to what is to do to follow this um, how it's called like craftsmanship principles like to write clean code uh, write tests follow um, principles like solid uh, things things like this it of course takes time but this is um, just by practicing these things uh, pairing with developers it's easy to do just it uh, it becomes a habit um, writing clean code uh, giving your variables good names making sure that your methods are not too long uh, writing tests like having, always having integration tests this is something that uh, for a software engineer is a must they don't even think about this um, but for us we still need to to learn this and uh, to keep these things in mind that uh, we don't just do a Jupyter notebook but we should also uh, make a service service out of this and then something that is readable maintainable mm -hmm. yeah. so I would say uh, learning uh, like trying to practice writing clean code and writing tests is uh, a very good exercise and this is something that we should do uh, first we should force ourselves but then it becomes a habit and our code becomes better I would say though, um, data scientists are sometimes working under different constraints than software engineers. So I wouldn't just say it's like, you know, like some, like a one-off analysis may not need a ton of tests or like integration. Yeah, yeah, which I think you told me, but I, I just wanna, um, you know, think about like what level is appropriate for this project, right? Like something going into production, uh, definitely. And like, for example, I think the level of like using version control is like appropriate for pretty much anything. I remember, uh, I think it was Caitlin Huden who like wrote even like for using that for SQL queries cause you always think you're not gonna need it but you do need it again. Um, so I, I think uh, there's definitely stuff to be learned there but not, um, for example, like writing a good commit message can be harder for an analysis project than I think a software engineering one. Cause it's often like, I've seen like some, um, you know, you structure a commit message, you say like, uh, you know, there's like five things you say, it's like, you can start with like fix bug, like add feature, so on and so forth. And sometimes with analysis, it's just not that clean cut. Um, so also recognizing where uh, there's a lot to learn from software engineering, but sometimes, uh, you know, you are operating on different types of problems. And so uh, not necessarily going, going all the way for, for every type. If I may quickly add to, to that, um, often there is a Jira ticket there is like uh, when an, uh, an analyst is doing some work, often there is a Jira ticket uh, that uh, describes the work. So it's useful just to put the Jira ticket number or whatever the, the, the bug tracking system we use. And that is already helpful for people who, for some reasons, decides to, uh, to go through the commit messages. And as since you mentioned uh, Jupyter notebooks and, and in the community, in the data science community, that there, are pe there are people who um, don't like notebooks and don't use them for anything. They just use uh, Python scripts. Um, there are other people who are using Jupyter notebooks for everything. And where do you fall on the scale from nothing at all to certain tasks? Uh, if or transitioning from starting in one point and then moving to another, how do you usually decide what is the appropriate place for Jupyter Notebooks if uh, it has an appropriate place in your um, routine, in your projects? I think a good way to look at it is um, the, when you're moving towards, uh, so usually when you start as a junior person, you tend to have opinions on everything and you say, use this, use this, this tool sucks, this tool is great. As you move towards um, a, a senior data science or a senior engineering position, it's important to take the position of this tool is right for X. Um, so I've heard it said, um, strong opinions loosely held. Um, and so I feel the same way about notebooks. They have their place in certain settings and in certain they don't. And I would never say never use notebooks. I think they're very important as a part of the data science workflow, because often as we start a data science project or analysis, we need to use them to explore the data, to get a feel for it, to shape it. And there's no faster way to do that than with the, the REPL. Um, you're just not gonna be able to write a program or have a test or anything that does that. 
then as you move to production, you should not use notebooks um, because they're not a good tool in production. So a good data scientist knows when to use notebooks and when to stop using notebooks is my opinion. And uh, when, if, you, if we're talking about moving to production, do you expect data scientists to be able to um, perform these tasks? Or do you think it's a new emerging role of machine learning engineers who are supposed to be taking the models and deploying them in production? How are the skills of deploying models and using them in production important for um, the data scientists to build their career? Or is it something that should be done in a different role entirely? I think that um, a lot of data science roles will not encompass that, and that's totally fine. There's different types of data scientists, but the more of that type of skill you gain, the more, I want to say, I don't know, quote, soft power you have, because the closer you get to uh, being able to show something, like either a dashboard or an analysis or something, to the non-technical person that's going to be making decisions based on it, um, the more flexibility you have in your career and the more uh, visibility you get in the company. Now, that can be both a good thing and a bad thing, because if the dashboard breaks, and the responsibility is on you. Um, but what I've seen is the more that people can move things closer to the ultimate final stakeholder, um, the, the more flexibility they have. Well, what I noticed uh, that many data scientists, they like modeling data, they're uh, modeling, creating models. They, they realize that to create models, they need to get data. So this is the, what they also tend to do. Uh, but uh, the first part of the process, uh, trying to, to understand the problem and then form it in uh, terms of machine learning, and then the last state, deploying it, this is something that many data scientists don't like to do because of many reasons, uh, because of how uh, the, the current courses, online courses or university uh, uh, courses are structured, how we do Kaggle, so the focus is mostly on modeling. So this is what most data scientists like to do. Uh, so what I see is it's very uh, beneficial for the career to try to to get to, to get into the, these first steps and these last steps to try to to take end-to-end -end ownership of uh, the entire process, and then it helps to to stand out, to get noticed. People in the company will know you. Uh, I think it's more a good thing than a bad thing, but there's also downsides. Uh, but I think uh, deployment is uh, uh, it's very nice to to be involved with, uh, to to involve um, to to do it. Even though if there are people who are doing this, uh, like machine learning engineers, where they will not mind if you're um, helping them, and sometimes they're busy with other things, and being able to do this. Um, ourselves is quite good also to move faster, to be more independent and to show results faster and also again be noticed. And if um, ideally in a perfect vacuum world, it would be great to know all of it. Of course, it's not possible. Um, what kind of um, uh, what would you call the you know minimal viable technological stack to know to be able to start with go into this um, role of data scientist and then perhaps learn more on the job? So what would be the the minimal requirements for the technological stack for data scientist? I think SQL, Python, or R, and Git slash GitHub. Um, you know, it depends some on the role. That doesn't mean like any data scientist at any position at any company you could get, but I think that's the really foundational skills and then you can grow from there. Cause I, you know, for example, like cloud technologies or like big data stuff. Well, that, the problem is that varies so much from company to company, right? So you learn one, like Etsy where I worked before, like use Scala, but like, I haven't used that since, right? So you don't want to spend a whole bunch of time learning Scala. And then, you know, that's not useful at your new company. Um, you know, or learning like this specific system. So I think those will be a good foundations. And then it's also expected, you know, you're going to pick up some of those tools on the job. Um, and I think especially if you're coming, 
not having work experience as a data scientist, right? If you're calibrating your job search well, the company won't expect, um, you know, you to have specific experience in like uh, in other technologies. Do you think there is a difference in the types of job you can expect, whether depending on whether you're proficient in Python or R? I, I think certainly, yes. Uh, um, so what I see, um, um, usually companies that um, use Python uh, in their tech stack, usually they uh, already think about uh, productionizing it because uh, Python comes with all these bells and whistles, like all these uh, uh, libraries for doing pretty much everything. And uh, usually uh, that's why uh, we use Python because we want to, uh, to cover the full cycle uh, from getting the data to training the model to deploying it. Uh, what I noticed with R, uh, usually the focus is more on the analysis part uh, than on deployment. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with R. I use it mostly for studies, but this is what I noticed that uh, and the, the part with deploying R models is more difficult and usually it's not the, not the focus. So probably this is more like an analyst uh, type of uh, work for R uh, while for Python it's more like a, a ML engineer type of work. Yeah, I would agree. Agree to that generally. Um, I do think also it's more common in job postings to see Python ask for for R, although I program in R and that's like my past three jobs, that's what I've used. Um, I would say now the languages are getting up to, like my co-author Jacqueline gave a talk on how they're hitting, uh, they're using R in production and getting like 5 million hits a day at T-Mobile. So I think you're right. I think one of the barriers can be engineers are often not familiar with R. It's like fairly different than programming language they may know. So either with Python, maybe they know Python or it seems more familiar. So that could be a barrier. Um, but certainly both languages I think are, you know, uh, have their strengths and weaknesses. And also there's, it's becoming, I, I hope like more common to use them together as well. So like R Studio has been doing a lot of work with Reticulate to make it really easy to go back and forth between Python and R. So maybe using R for analysis or plotting, but like building a, you know, a certain type of model in Python first. Um, so I think that will eventually be the future. Um, so I would say in general, like if you just, if you're like, what language will get me the most, will open up the most jobs? I think Python is probably the answer. The reason I've kept with R is I really like the community. I think it can be a bit easier for people who come from a non computer science background um, because like dplyr for doing data analysis is quite similar to SQL. It's kind of human readable. It's like select, filter, group by. Um, you know, plotting's nice uh, with ggplot. I think even Python folks agree that ggplot's usually like the, the kind of gold standard for data visualization. There's a lot of ports of it in Python. Um, but yeah, so I would, I would say, um, you know, it depends on the role. If you are looking for more ML type role, Python's probably more likely to be asked for. If you're looking for more an analysts, you know, I'd say maybe that's more of a split and some will ask for R, some will ask for Python and some teams will use both. Um, and so you can, you can come in with either. Yeah, I wanted to uh, kind of elaborate on uh, a few uh, things about R. Like I personally use uh, Python more, uh, but a few of my colleagues, they kind of swear by R. Uh, can you m give a bit more examples uh, in addition to uh, ggplot uh, and some of the areas where you think, let's say where the areas where R kind of, kind of blows Python out of the water in terms of features and usability? Yeah, so ggplot, dplyr I mentioned, um, like versus pandas, although actually one of my former colleagues, Michael Chow, is working on a library called Suba for basically uh, like porting dplyr to Python. Um, it's also really good, one of the benefits Suba offers is you can actually query SQL from writing that code, right? So dplyr is in the back end dbplyr, so I can write dplyr code. If I set it up with SQL, it'll translate that to SQL, pull the results back down. And then I saw someone in the YouTube comments also mentioned Shiny, which I think is a really great way to um, develop and deploy web applications without maybe having like any background in CSS or HTML. Uh, there's a package called Flex Dashboard where you know you can you can make a Shiny app using just essentially like R Markdown, like not even going into any of these like servers or like you know any worrying about that. Um, and also, and the final thing is I think the R community is really especially welcoming and diverse community. 
um, to people from outside of programming, from all different backgrounds. And that's not to say Python isn't, I'm just like less in that. And Python also is a much bigger community because it is a more widely used language for lots of purposes. So I feel like with the R community, it's a little easier to feel like, oh, I'm getting this kind of like handle on it. Um, you know, I understand like who some of the main people are and there are some great people who are really encouraging for folks like getting started. And I think there's a big lack of gatekeeping, uh, which I really like. Um, so yeah, those are some of the main, um, like first the program points and also the community that I've really enjoyed. Oh, and also the stats, like usually if you wanna do like kind of cutting edge statistical stuff, like coming from academics, often that will be implemented first in, in R um, because that's where yeah, and academics will release it as a package. Time series also, like R yeah. time series packages are so much, much nicer than in Python. Oh yeah, Rob Heinemann does like great work and he's redoing a whole thing now too to work with the, with the tidyverse, which is like ours collection for like tidy data manipulation uh, and visualization and whatnot. I love how uh, being a PyData community, we are basically selling our attendees on R now, but that's good. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you let me in. Um, <laughs> the, the, the big mistake. Um, yeah. <laughs> and to just wrap uh, wrap up the conversation um, about languages. Um, of course, Python and R are dominating the data science uh, community, but um, Scala is being used for um, data processing and some machine learning. There's also, um, there have been Swift for TensorFlow. Um, Alexei, you wrote a book, uh, Mastering Java for Data Science. So what are your thoughts on the future of other languages in data sciences, in data science and um, what kind of place they may have and uh, where do you see them? I guess we could start with Alexei. You wrote a book on Java and data science. So yeah. <laughs> you take so this one. Don't use Java for data science. <laughs> I mean, well, because um, <laughs> It's a nice language, but um, in data science, the, the way we work is um, like it's much more interactive. Uh, interactive. So you want to to play with the data, you want to quickly look at the plot or see the results. In uh, the Java ecosystem, it's much harder. So there is no such um, like we don't. Have, for example, in Java, there is no uh, analog to uh, Jupyter notebooks or IPython. There is no such thing. And tools like pandas. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe <laughs> now there is, but uh, it's uh, if it works, uh, ninety percent yeah, of the there's time. There's kind it's of a good. Java REPL. It's like a REPL-ish. Yes. Well, now with latest versions, uh, I think there is officially a Java REPL. Um, for example, five years ago there was nothing like that, but uh, IPython uh, was a thing. I don't know, like. 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, so I think this is why Python uh, got the momentum and now it has such a big community. Um, that said, uh, I think Java has a good niche. Um, so in things uh, when we cannot use microservices, so usually what we do is we create a model and then we put it to microservice and other services call this microservice to get variations of the model. This is how we usually do. But in certain areas, we cannot do this. For example, in advertisement, in real-time bidding, it's the time limits, time restrictions that we have do not allow us to call any services. So we cannot make a call to a microservice. So we have to do on the, all the computations inside our uh, our code, our environment. And this is typically Java or C++ or Go. And in these cases, we want to um, put the logic, um, like all this model, model, all the predictions inside the code. So this is the areas where we might need Java. Um, but in other cases, um, Python, just knowing Python is enough to cover pretty much everything. Um, one other thing, uh, I think in addition to Java, um, I think knowing C and C++, maybe more just C, sometimes is beneficial because Python is uh, slow. So sometimes uh, it might happen, then you need to optimize certain parts. And then um, if you like C, some people don't, but if you do like, then you can write some code in C and then call it from Python. And uh, this improves uh, 
performance, I don't know, by orders of magnitude, it can be a thousand times faster. So there are cases like that. Of course, you can do it without C with other tools, but if you know it already, sometimes it's helpful. And also most of the machine learning li libraries like XGBoost or uh, TensorFlow or MXNet, they're written in C++. And if you want to, to know how they work uh, and if something doesn't work, Sometimes you might want to go into the code and see what's the problem, and then knowing C++ is also helpful. Here are the languages that I find myself using. Um, so Python a lot. I would highly recommend everybody learn um, to use Unix really well because most of the servers in the world are run on Unix. Um, and whether you're working on a Mac laptop or you're working in the cloud, um, bash scripting is always going to be something that you use a lot and that is very useful. Um, so command line, very important. Um, JSON, get super familiar with JSON. A lot of the data that comes in, especially if you work in areas um, that have logs or e-commerce or anything like that, that's all going to be in JSON. Um, so getting familiar with that format is going to be good. Um, and then either Python or R. Um, and then I think it's also good to become familiar with a second language that is not primarily geared towards data analysis. Uh, so either Java or Go or, or something like that, just so you understand how. So the first language that you learn is going to be the hardest to learn. Um, but then you can apply those concepts to every language that you learn afterwards. And you can say, oh, this is how it is in R. Oh, this is how it is in Python. Oh, this is how it is in Python. This is the differences in Java. And so the more you start to learn of different patterns of languages, you start to pick up like the underlying patterns of software development itself, um, which we come back to again and again. And I think that helps, even if you don't do any of that in your job as a data scientist, I think it's empowering to understand what's underlying the the code that you write so you can work on it or even as alexi said like to introspect some of the classes when you were listing uh different languages or formats to learn i'm surprised you didn't mention yaml yeah my best buddy yaml yeah so uh so yaml is the the format for configuring a lot of stuff. So for example, if you want to spin up a lot of um, services in the cloud in AWS, uses a lot of YAML. Um, Airflow uses a lot of YAML. A lot of what I do these days is actually configuring YAML to run services that kick off jobs, that run models, that eventually spit out a tiny bit of JSON onto the screen. And that's my job as a data scientist. So I also recommend learning YAML. So all this stuff that's kind of like not part of data science, but is like ambiently around data science and environment and in tech in general, I think is really good to learn. To, to that extent, YAML is, uh, like you said, used a lot in um, all, so all sorts of infrastructure set up. And to what degree do you think uh, data scientists should be familiar with uh, cloud infrastructure, be it AWS or uh, Azure or Google Cloud? or um, um, mastering Kubernetes and Docker. Um, how important are these technologies for a data scientist? I think, again, you're going to be exposed to them at some point. Um, like whether, um, whether you work on them as your primary responsibility or not, your code is probably going to go to the cloud or you have to send some data somewhere or you have to hit a web service or you have to do this or you have to SSH into a server and change some stuff. So I think all of that is just part of a generally well-rounded education and technology. And the more you learn about all this stuff surrounding data science, the again, the more empowered you'll be to change different things and to talk about those things from that reference point. And, uh, what I noticed that uh, people who really know these things like AWS, Kubernetes, uh, Terraform, whatnot, there are not so many of them. Uh, usually this is DevOps engineers or SREs or sound software engineers, and uh, they have a lot of work. So typically if you ask them to do something, it takes time. Um, so it's better to, when they have time to do together with them, to learn from them and next time try to do this independently. So first you would take a lot of them. They will um, 
big lot and then you will learn this and this is a useful skill this allows you to be independent and also be able again to cover the the whole cycle and as i said many data scientists don't do this but if you if you take initiative and try to also go the extra mile and learn all these tools um, it's quite beneficial and you'll uh, be able to move faster and uh, again don't wait on somebody else to finish your job when you yourself can do this yeah and i think we brought this up earlier but also just like there are always trade-offs here right like you sort of said like it'd be great to know everything but it's not like you know something you're not learning something if you're focusing on these tools so i do think it's important to keep in mind i kind of was saying earlier the balance of like okay what's useful now um also it can be easy, I think, to get overwhelmed. And if you don't really have a use case for it right away, I think it's harder to learn something. Um, so I would sort of like take it a little bit as it comes and it's like, okay, um, you know, here, uh, it, it sounds like my new team is learning Docker and they don't use it that often, but like maybe I'll like ask someone and learn it from there and like study some stuff from that. And that, that's kind of what you learn like this month. And then maybe in the future, you like you take on a little bit of AWS, um, you know, but maybe you decide actually I'm going to focus now on some of my non-technical skills. I'm like, I think I'm having a hard time communicating with stakeholders. I'm going to try working on that. Or, you know, I'm going to learn how to, how to write better. Um, or I'm going to, you know, learn to get better at, um, you know, learn one of the newest R packages and like the updates that is came in dplyr and how that might be used to my work, right? So, you know, I do think it's it's great to learn more things, but also you can get very far sometimes with some gaps in your knowledge because either other people fill that or it's not needed for your specific type of role. And you find that um, both in data science uh, or in software engineering job with any tech uh, job really the learning never stops there are new technologies all the time there are new frameworks there are new uh, maybe even programming languages new best practices and approaches to things and um, you all are probably still learning something new discovering something new so to just wrap it up um, this discussion on the technologies to learn is there any technology that you're um, excited to start learning or something that you would like to dabble with, not necessarily uh, for a project you're working on, but maybe there's something you're curious about or something that you've uh, never had time to try to work with. Um, what would you personally would like to uh, learn a little bit better or from scratch? Um, for me, I see this trend of uh, infrastructure becomes a bottleneck, and I mentioned it multiple times already that uh, people who, who have the skills, they are always busy with something else. But there are tools who makes, uh, who, that make this uh, job of deploying models or experimenting easier, like Kubeflow or MLflow or SageMaker. Uh, this is what I'm trying to, to get a grasp of, like try to learn these tools. So for example, I'm now trying to see how to use Kubeflow and see how it, uh, using it will be beneficial for our organization, how using it we can move faster with, uh, with the way we uh, do machine learning. For me, something that I'm interested in right now is Streamlit. Um, it's a new Python project that I think is similar to Shiny um, in that it allows you to spin up a machine learning dashboard very quickly. Um, so it, it has pretty simple code patterns, but basically my big belief is that the faster you can show your model, um, the better it is for you as a data scientist, because then you can put your work out there and Streamlit allows you to do that very easily. So there's a lot involved in showing a model. So you have to spin up a web server, then you have to write a service, then you have to pick all your data, then you have to do this, this, this. Streamlit abstracts a lot of that away from you. And um, I've been playing with it for a side project and it's, it's pretty neat. So I'm interested to explore more stuff like that that are kind of like solidifying the foundations uh, of data science and bringing everything together into one thing. Emily, do you have anything uh, you, you would like to learn? Uh, so I'm actually in the process of learning Docker now, which is also a fun thing. Uh, it's just something that my team uses. Um, so like working some with them 
it's just not something that's really been you know needed or used in in past companies so i'm looking forward to learning that yeah docker is uh, definitely being used a lot in data science um i think i um run out of questions for now but we can turn to slido and i'm sure there are questions from the audience that we could uh bring up uh Alexi, yeah. do you want to start with any uh, of the questions so uh i think i can just uh, read out questions uh from the top so we'll do it for you know 10 15 minutes and then we'll wrap everything up with I know your closing statements uh, uh, to uh, the audience. So uh, the first, our most upvoted question is about AutoML. So that's something that we haven't talked about. And particularly the question is, will these platforms and systems uh, replace uh, data scientists in production? Should I answer? <laughs> well, I have an opinion about this and since I started talking. so I. I don't think it will uh, replace data scientists um, because right now we, I already see the trend that uh, uh, machine learning tools become easier to use. So there's a trend of uh, commoditizing it. So five years ago, it was a lot more difficult to, to train a model. Now you just take uh, an off the shelf library and train a model. Even better, you can just throw it in uh, Google machine learning and then have a have a model that can take a top 10 place in Kaggle competition. Uh, but uh, to me, it looks like it takes care of the boring work, like uh, trying to find the best set of parameters. Uh, it's fun maybe to do it first 10 times, but then it becomes tedious. And then it just, uh, just takes off uh, the load from your shoulders so it, and then you can focus on more um, more innovative work or like on the really difficult parts for example translating the requirements the business requirements into uh, into uh, phrasing them in uh, machine learning terms uh, auto ml will not help with that and if we become better with these skills auto ml will not replace us as uh, data scientists. So well, we should try to step out of uh, this just modeling uh, phase and try to to go into other uh, other steps uh, again uh, have and to end ownership of our projects. Um, also being involved into uh, initial uh, the, the very first initial discussions of how do we actually solve this problem with machine learning. Yeah, I think Randy Au, who I'm a big fan of, he was one of our Ender Chapter interviewees. He said in the YouTube comments, uh, until AutoML can talk to a PM and understand what the heck they want and figure out how to collect data to test it, I've still got a job, uh, which I think is so true, right? Like I sort of talked about the same thing with like why it's helpful with personal projects to like collect data yourself to figure out what you're asking, because that's a huge part of the role. I would say like, and, and that is something though to that of, you, you know, if the only skill you ever work on is like, you know, tweaking hyperparameters and like making like a better model, like with in very strict kind of conditions, like a clean data set. Like I do think that that is going to go away somewhat, um, right? As I think that is going to be automated. And so it's all, as, as Lexi was saying, all these other parts of the job, um, whether it's deploying it or whether it's the parts beforehand, um, that will really, that will definitely stick around because that's a, a, a huge part of the job is figuring out like, what do people even want? Like, is the data being logged? How can we start logging it? Let me talk to all these different people. Um, and it's not just like pushing the button on the, on the auto ML part to get a well, high performing model. All right, uh, our next somewhat related question and we discussed that uh, briefly, but uh, what are your opinions on the data science field uh, three years from now? Uh, what do you think it's uh, going to look like? Hard to say. I think um, there's probably going to continue to be an increased focus on the orchestration of these systems of getting data science, quote unquote, into production, where it's not just a person doing the analysis, but there's systems. I think there's going to be a lot more consolidation. Um, I mentioned Streamlit as a tool that allows you to create dashboards. There's um, Kubeflow. 
There's um, TensorBoard, which allows you to see the results of TensorFlow. So there's a lot of these things coming together that are more platformy. Um, whereas 10 years ago, we started out with some scripts and an analysis and a notebook. And so that still exists. Uh, the future is here. It's just very unevenly distributed, right? So that still exists though across a lot of companies, but a lot of the larger companies that we see as leaders in the field are working on consolidating all of these into one thing. And so I think a lot of the work, um, and I think Alexi alluded to this, that the um, the platforms are already there and the algorithms are already there. It's not as easy as that, but basically, so AWS has SageMaker, which allows you to pre-pick a bunch of different algorithms. The problem is connecting SageMaker to your data source to a dashboarding tool. And I think that's where a lot of the, the jobs in the future will be. And, um, what I noticed is a few years ago, many companies were hiring the data scientists as investment. They realized the potential, the things they could do, they could do with data science. So they hired more people than they actually needed. And I think this will stop soon. So right now with the current crisis, many companies are not hiring anymore. And uh, I think they will be more careful with uh, how they spend money. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean that they will stop hiring data scientists. They might be just a bit more selective, but this is also a good thing because uh, now they will understand what exactly they want and uh, they will not hire more than they need. Do you expect the companies really to better understand um, what they what they want rather than just end up uh, collecting more and more and more data? Well, right now, um, many companies do not have uh, a lot of cash to, well, like they have to be more careful with how they spend money. Um, so keeping data just for the sake of keeping is expensive. Uh, I mean, it's maybe cheaper than uh, hiring, uh, hiring people, but still like there are some costs and um, I think uh, I do see a trend that um, there is awareness. Um, they know what is possible to solve because uh, um, now even high management knows what machine learning is and uh, they tend to, to now have some sort of understanding what is possible to do and what is not. Uh, so I don't think companies will keep data just for the sake of doing this. Uh, and again, maybe hiring more selectively, not because some consultants from McKinsey told them to do it. I think the other thing, the other piece of um, less data is there are now a lot of regulations around data collection. Um, so CCPA comes into play, um, uh, GDPR in Europe. And so for every additional piece of data you collect, companies are more likely to now be sued for it. Um, especially if you're collecting user data. So I've noticed um, there isn't like an enormous um, movement to purge companies of data, but a lot of companies are now assessing what they have and being a lot more cautious about what they do use. Hey, uh, well, the next question is more on the technical side. Uh, do you think that uh, it's possible to build entire end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline uh, in Python, or do you need to use uh, kind of other languages that will surround the, uh, all the Python code uh, to kind of achieve your goals? Depends on how big the pipeline is. Um, if it's just something that you're building for 10 users, I think it's fine. If you are, um, say, for example, Instagram and you need to surface recommendations, you're probably going to want to use another language like Go or Java. And they actually have written a ton of posts about how they're having issues scaling Python. And I think they actually like basically deactivated or um, redid the garbage collector for Python because they were having out of scale issues. So it depends on the size, um, depends on what else your company is using. I think for yeah for middle sized companies it's entirely possible. Of course, there are some infrastructural things like Kubernetes, and if you want to write a plugin for Kubernetes for whatever reason, you will need to use Go. Uh, but if you don't 
touch the, these things. You just use them as a user, uh, as a service, and you don't care what's inside. Um, then I think it's possible to do pretty much everything uh, in Python. Of course, there are some costs because Python is slower for many things. Uh, but for example, if you want just to put more money on this and worry about optimizing later, it's certainly possible. Uh, especially in AWS, for example, things like AWS Lambda, you can write all this code in Python and then takes care of automatically scaling it up and down. You don't need to worry about anything at all. Uh, and it's possible to do it with Python. But of course, like when uh, you talk about billion users, then it's more difficult. And that's why in, uh, in advertisement, uh, Python is not used at all because it's just not possible to, to handle the load there with Python. If I could add to that, uh, I think uh, Vicky had a good example of Instagram and on-device inference. So um, for the most cases, you can probably do everything in Python, but there will be, um, um, well, let's say, edge scenarios when you have to do something on device, be it uh, Android device or uh, a camera or um, uh, maybe even um, like a tablet or something where the latency it has to be minimal. And in this case, again, if you are also the person who's in charge of deployment, um, then you may need to use other languages as well. But then uh, very likely if uh, it's a company of that size, there will be some sort of role split and perhaps uh, you won't end up doing the whole pipeline yourself. You're probably gonna have teammates who are gonna be doing parts of it. So uh, even then, you may still be fine just with Python. Uh, so let's uh, take uh, this last question. And uh, how do you see the path from a project manager to a data scientist? Uh, I guess to elaborate, like, is that possible? What steps uh, would a person need to take? Well, I guess uh, for a project manager, like from what I understand, usually this is not a technical role. Um, so the first thing that a project manager would need to do is to learn coding, uh, pick up Python, for example. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, trying to do uh, simple projects like uh, getting the data from somewhere possibly cleaned for the start, and then trying to put it in scikit-learn and uh, trying to validate the model uh, would be the next step. And then uh, just to go deeper, try to then as a next step, get the data from somewhere. Uh, basically what I'm trying to say is uh, have a project and, and try to work on this. But first, of course, try to learn Python because without it, it will be just too difficult. Yeah, and I think the good thing about a product manager role, depending on what you're product managing, is often there's a good role for you to start like working with data, like whether it's like analyzing how the web page is doing, you know, like even if that's starting with like Looker or like other things, so maybe trying to do that with Python, I think, you know, that can absolutely become part of your role. Um, and, you know, when you're gaining more technical skills and like eventually start interviewing, like not remembering to, to think about like how many transferable skills you do have, especially on the non-technical side, right? You're, you're probably really good at communicating, working with multiple stakeholders, like managing a team, like thinking in that product mindset, like being very practical. Um, so a lot of those are, are hugely advantageous in a data science role, depending on what type of role it is. Um, so I always, I always recommend to people who are transitioning from another field, not to feel like, oh, all that time was wasted. And like, let me almost pretend it never happened, but think about like what, what will transfer? Because I think a lot of those things, um, do and are, and are helpful when you, uh, work in, in data science. Yeah. Uh, personally, I would like to add to the uh, last comment that, uh, you made is, uh, like not try to think that you wasted all the time, uh, because, well, just the communication skills that you acquire along the way are extremely useful. And the other thing, like alternatively, is just uh, too grim of a view. Is like, uh, yeah, and it looks too risky, right? You're almost like forgetting everything that happened in the past and starting over. So uh, yeah. Uh, so I think we'll stop with questions here. And uh, kind of now the 
floor is uh, all yours uh, for any closing statements, uh, any anything that uh, you would like to share uh, with the attendees. I guess we can go with uh, the same order that we uh, started with. So uh, Vicky, Alexi, and then Emily. Um, let's see. So it's it's a tough job market right now. It's a tough situation. Um, it's important to stand out. And I'm going to reemphasize that the, a good way to stand out right now is um, to learn engineering skills in addition to data analysis skills. Um, don't stress about uh, learning every single framework out there, just pick one single thing that you want to learn, um, whether it's this specific R package or this specific Python thing, and really dig into it. Try to understand how it works. Um, have one project that you can talk all the way through all the successes and failures if you don't have any projects before, and um, network around the community. And you're already doing that by being at this talk um, and reach out and talk to other people about what's going on. That's all I have. Um, I think I repeated it multiple times that you should focus on the problem, not on the solution. Um, I think this could be one of the main takeaways. Um, and then, of course, uh, once you solve your problem, uh, tell the world about this, create a blog post, share it on social media. Um, and then once you are already on the job, uh, then try to get involved into uh, all the aspects, all the areas uh, like also involved into discussing with stake, uh, discussions with stakeholders, trying to understand uh, how it's possible to solve this problem in with machine learning and then also with deployment. Yeah, uh, and also to, we didn't really talk um, about like the current situation, like COVID nineteen. But as Vicky mentioned, like it is an especially tough job market now, both because fewer companies are hiring and some big companies have laid off people, including data scientists. So those folks are also on the market. Um, so I would say, you know, and in general, like don't view this as like a, an indication of your worth, like how you do on the job market, but. You know, especially now, maybe it's helpful to be flexible about the exact job title um, or, you know, like the, the exact company type you must have to work for. And that doesn't mean like you should take a job you know you'll hate or like give up something that's very important to you, but to, to remain a little bit flexible and know, but no, like this too shall pass. And also that the getting your first job in data science is the hardest and it does get easier from there, especially if you're doing things that like we've all recommended, um, like building your network. Um, making blog posts, all that sort of things will help. Um, and yeah, and the final thing to close out, uh, cause this is a little bit of a downer is that like, but you can do it like data science needs you. Um, I really like Cassie Co Kovashat's uh, definition of like data science, the art of making data useful. And that can be applied in many different roles. And I think you can have a big impact um, on companies in diff different places, even if you never like go work at Google as a research scientist to really think about like what's important to you. And to you, it may not be working on the cutting end algorithm. It may be, I want to help nonprofits. And if sometimes I do that in Excel, like that's okay, because I'm more focused on the mission of the company than the exact tools um, that you use. So just, you know, try not to, you know, listen to other people. You're here to, at a panel listening to our advice, but try not to let necessarily their values or their gatekeeping or something inform uh, how you want to structure your career. Right. Uh, so I want to thanks, uh, thank everyone, uh, our panelists and our attendees for your time today. Uh, enjoy your weekend. And one thing that, uh, so we will, if I haven't screwed anything up, we will share the recording on uh, the meetup page. And the other thing I know uh, by monitoring the comment section, uh, people were asking for links to different either tools or blog articles that we mentioned. So uh, kind of uh, as the last thing I will ask our panelists is that they send uh, anything that they think our attendees might find useful to read or watch. Uh, uh, and then we'll kind of compile all those resources and just uh, share them uh, both uh, on meetup.com and the uh, YouTube comment section. Right. Thanks, everyone. And thank you for having us up here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Goodbye. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>